Hello, I'm Jeff. My wife and I host Message of Hope. Message of Hope wants to be your weekly inspirational, motivational, and non-judgmental friend to help you through your week as we share Bible truth and life experiences to let you know you're not alone. Let's join Sandra to see what Message of Hope she has today. Hey guys, I'm Sandra, and today I want to share about my struggle with the question, will I go to heaven when I die? Because my thinking is that surely others must ask themselves this question and, like me, desperately seek to have some assurance on the most important part of our life, which is our death. Because life is short, but eternity is forever. I was raised attending and being actively involved in church my whole life. I feel I have tried to be a good person each day of my life by treating others the way I'd want to be treated, by helping others when I have the resources available, attending church, and just generally trying to be a good person. But I am currently struggling with the thought of whether I will go to heaven or not. I think I will, but I'm not sure. And I wonder how some people are so adamant about knowing that they are going to heaven, while I still feel unsure. It could be because I'm getting older and know that naturally my time on earth is growing shorter, or that I don't want the life given to me to be one where I just existed. I want to know that I accomplished something that made this world a better place. For my family, my friends, or those who live after me. I so desire to know that my God, Jehovah, is proud of me for who I was and what I did for him with this precious life that he has gifted me with. I am seeking reassurance to give myself peace of mind and or to find out what I possibly need to change in my life to be reassured that I will live eternally with my God. If you've had the same questions, I invite you to join along with me today as I search for the answer to the most important questions anyone could ever ask themselves, in my opinion. So let's dive in. As we begin to read in 1 John 1, thought to be written by John the Evangelist, a son of Zebedee, and a disciple of Jesus. It begins by saying, We want to tell you about the word that gives life, the one who existed before the world began. This is the one we have heard and have seen with our own eyes. We saw what he did, and our hands touched him. Yes, the one who is life was shown to us. We saw him, and so we can tell others about him. We now tell you about him. He is the eternal life that was with God the Father and was shown to us. We are telling you about what we have seen and heard because we want you to have fellowship with us. The fellowship we share together is with God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write these things to you so that you can be full of joy with us. Okay, so I'm thinking, yes, I want to be full of joy with you. And obviously, first and foremost, I, we, have to believe that God, Jehovah, exists and that he created the world, right? You, me, and everything in it. I believe in God and that he created the moon, the stars, every living creature, everything. So I'm pretty good with this step. I would assume since you're listening to this podcast, You're good with this step too, but that's up to you to determine for yourself. Let's pick up in verse 5. We heard the true teaching from God, now we tell it to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. So if we say that we share in life with God, but we continue living in darkness, we are liars who don't follow the truth. We should live in the light where God is. 
If we live in the light, we have fellowship with each other, and the blood sacrifice of Jesus, God's Son, washes away every sin and makes us clean. If we say that we have no sin, we are fooling ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God will forgive us. We can trust God to do this. He always does what is right. He will make us clean from all the wrong things we have done. If we say that we have not sinned, we are saying that God is a liar and that we don't accept his true teaching. Okay, I do recognize that I am a sinner, and had God not sent his son Jesus, Yeshua, to die for my sins, I would have no hope to ever live a sin-free life worthy of eternity on my own. But because of his great love, his faithfulness, his mercy, and his grace, I have the option, which is the free will to choose whether or not I desire to live eternally. I do this by choosing to follow or ignore the teachings, the instructions, the commands given to me in Jehovah's inspired word, the Holy Bible. This is a choice I personally believe that I make each day, each hour, even minute of my life, as I make my own free will choices between right or wrong. Let's read on in chapter 2. My dear children, I write this letter to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone sins, we have Jesus Christ to help us. He always did what was right, so he is able to defend us before God the Father. Jesus is the way our sins are taken away, and he is the way all people can have their sins taken away too. If we obey what God has told us to do, then we are sure that we know him. If we say we know God, but do not obey his commands, we are lying. The truth is not in us. But when we obey God's teaching, his love is truly working in us. This is how we know that we are living in him. If we say we live in God, we must live the way Jesus lived. My dear friends, I am not writing a new command to you. It is the same command you have had since the beginning. This command is the teaching you have already heard. But what I write is also a new command. It is a true one. You can see its truth in Jesus and in yourselves. The darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Someone might say, I'm in the light. But if they hate any of their brothers or sisters in God's family, they are still in the darkness. Those who love their brothers and sisters live in the light, and there is nothing in them that will make them do wrong. But whoever hates their brother or sister is in darkness. They live in darkness. They don't know where they're going because the darkness has made them blind. I write to you, dear children, because your sins are forgiven through Christ. I write to you, fathers, because you know the one who existed from the beginning. I write to you, young people, because you have defeated the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know the one who existed from the beginning. I write to you, young people, because you are strong. The word of God lives in you, and you have defeated the evil one. Don't love this evil world or the things in it. If you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. This is all there is in the world. Wanting to please our sinful selves, wanting the sinful things we see, and being too proud of what we have. But none of these comes from the Father. They come from the world. The world is passing away. And all things that people want in the world are passing away. But whoever does what God wants will live forever. Amen. Okay, to me, this is telling me, if I obey what God has told me to do, 
then I am sure that I know him. If I say I know God, but I do not obey his commands, I am lying and the truth isn't in me. But when I obey God's teaching, his love is truly working in me, and this is how I know if I'm living in him. So from what I'm understanding, it's telling me it takes dedication and some work on my part. I have to be reading his word to know him better and to better understand the instructions given on how to live the life he has gifted me with in the way he wants me to live it. I do this by following the examples he showed to us in the way he lived his life on earth and by following the teachings on how to live that life that he left us in the testimonies of those that are shared with us who were alive at the same time he was to leave us firsthand information on how to live correctly and also showing us the outcomes when wrong choices are made. It also reassures that when we are truly trying to live life right but make mistakes by sinning, that Jesus knows our heart on the matter. And if we are sincerely trying to do right and we confess our sins to him and ask forgiveness for it, he will defend us before our Father God. As we read in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this means that I have to ask forgiveness each time I sin by doing something wrong or by ignoring something in his word that it's told me to do, or if I'm falling short to do all I'm expected to do. Similar to me as a mother with my children, once we have given instructions, we expect them to follow through with them. We still love them, even though we don't approve of the wrong behavior. So our faith and connection to God, from what I'm understanding, is something we have to constantly be aware of and working on. Because like our children, once they know how they are to behave and they have grown into adults, it's then up to them to be of their own free will to choose whether to do what's right or wrong. And as a parent, my faith, my actions can't save them. It's out of my hands at that point because then they're operating of their own free will. And that's the freedom God, Jehovah, has given us. He loves us. He wants us to live eternally by choosing him and by living in his correct ways. But it's up to us whether or not we actually choose to do it. And in the end, we will have to answer to him as we face our eternity, whether it be in heaven or in hell, as a result of those choices that we had the free will to make. Reading on in verse 18, My dear children, the end is near. You have heard that the enemy of Christ is coming, and now many enemies of Christ are already here. So we know that the end is near. These enemies were in our group, but they left us. They did not really belong with us. If they were really a part of our group, they would have stayed with us, but they left. This shows that none of them really belonged with us. You have the gift that the Holy One gave you, so you all know the truth. Do you think I'm writing this letter because you don't know the truth? No, I am writing because you do know the truth, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. So who is the liar? It is the one who says Jesus is not the Messiah. Whoever says that is the enemy of Christ, the one who does not believe in the Father or in his Son. Whoever does not believe in the Son does not have the Father, but whoever accepts the Son has the Father too. Be sure that you continue to follow the teaching you heard from the beginning. If you do that, you will always be in the Son and in the Father. And this is what the Son promised us, eternal life. I am writing this letter about those who are trying to lead you into the wrong way. Christ gave you a special gift. You still have this gift in you. So you don't need anyone to teach you. The gift he gave you 
teaches you about everything. It is a true gift, not a false one. So continue to live in Christ as his gift taught you. Yes, my dear children, live in him. If we do this, we can be without fear on the day when Christ comes. We will not need to hide and be ashamed when he comes. You know that Christ always did what was right. So you know that all those who do what is right are God's children. Okay, personally, I feel this is saying to not believe everything we hear, not to follow someone's teaching just because they appear to be a teacher of God's word, that we have a special gift and an anointing, an unction, if you will, within us, and that is the Holy Spirit given to us when we believe in God. And that spirit will help to guide us, to give us little checks in our spirit about certain people or situations, and that we can also watch for telltale signs through the way they are living their life, or in other words, if they're practicing what they preach. But ultimately, God says the Holy Spirit will teach us. We don't need anyone else's influences or to believe things just because that's what we are taught by man. No, God's Word will teach us, and the Holy Spirit will teach and guide us. Okay, chapter 3 goes on to say, The Father has loved us so much. This shows how much He loved us. We are called children of God, and we really are His children. But the people in the world don't understand that we are God's children because they have not known Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. We have not yet been shown what we will be in the future, but we know that when Christ comes again, we will be like Him. We will see Him just as He is. He is pure, and everyone who has this hope in Him keeps themselves pure like Christ. Anyone who sins breaks God's law. Yes, sinning is the same as living against God's law. You know that Christ came to take away people's sins. There is no sin in Christ. So whoever lives in Christ does not continue to sin. If they continue to sin, they have never really understood Christ and have never known him. Dear children, don't let anyone lead you into the wrong way. Christ always did what was right. So to be good like Christ, you must do what is right. The devil has been sinning since the beginning. Anyone who continues to sin belongs to the devil. The Son of God came for this, to destroy the devil's work. Those who are God's children do not continue to sin because the new life God gave them stays in them. They cannot keep sinning because they have become children of God. So we can see who God's children are and who the devil's children are. These are the ones who are not God's children, those who don't do what is right, and those who do not love their brothers and sisters in God's family. This is the teaching you have heard from the beginning. We must love each other. Don't be like Cain. He belonged to the evil one. Cain killed his brother. But why did he kill him? Because what Cain did was evil, and what his brother did was good. Brothers and sisters, don't be surprised when the people of this world hate you. We know that we have left death and have come into life. We know this because we love each other as brothers and sisters. Anyone who does not love is still in death. Anyone who hates a fellow believer is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life. This is how we know what real love is. Jesus gave his life for us, so we should give our lives for each other as brothers and sisters. Suppose a believer who is rich enough to have all the necessities of life sees a fellow believer who is poor 
and does not have even basic needs. What if the rich believer does not help the poor one? Then it is clear that God's love is not in that person's heart. My children, our love should not be only words and talk. No, our love must be real. We must show our love by the things we do. That's how we know we belong to the way of truth. And when our hearts make us feel guilty, we can still have peace before God because God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. My dear friends, if we don't feel that we are doing wrong, we can be without fear when we come to God. And God gives us what we ask for. We receive it because we obey God's commands and do what pleases Him. This is what God commands, that we believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, and that we love each other as He commanded. All who obey God's commands live in God, and God lives in them. How do we know that God lives in us? We know because of the Spirit He gave us. Wow, I really am God's child. Already! He is pure and sin-free, and I must strive to live my life as He did. And if I mess up, I am to ask forgiveness, knowing if it's with a sincere heart, I will be forgiven, and the sin will be remembered no more. Isn't that an awesome assurance? One sure sign that I'm living right is how I treat others, and we are commanded to love each other. Loving each other means caring about others enough to help them with gifts, money, talents, food, friendship, companionship, whatever they need. I can't just act like I love people. I must show my love in the things that I do for them. And after knowing these things, God's word assures me that if I don't feel that I am doing wrong, I can be without fear when I come to God and God gives us what we ask for. We receive it because we obey God's commands and do what pleases Him. This is what God commands that we believe in his son, Jesus Christ, and that we love each other as he commanded. That's awesome. I'm feeling better already. Let's go on to 1 John 4. My dear friends, many false prophets are in the world now, so don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. This is how you can recognize God's spirit. One spirit says, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah who came to earth and became a man. That spirit is from God. Another spirit refuses to say this about Jesus. That spirit is not from God. This is the spirit of the enemy of Christ. You have heard that the enemy of Christ is coming, and now he is already in the world. My dear children, you belong to God, so you have already defeated these false prophets. That's because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And they belong to the world. So what they say is from the world too. And the world listens to what they say. But we are from God. So the people who know God listen to us. But the people who are not from God don't listen to us. This is how we know the spirit that is true and the spirit that is false. Dear friends, we should love each other because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has become God's child, and so everyone who loves knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love to us. He sent his only son into the world to give us life through him. True love is God's love for us, not our love for God. He sent his son as the way to take away our sins. That is how much God loved us, dear friends. So we also must love each other. 
No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us. If we love each other, God's love has reached its goal. It is made perfect in us. We know that we live in God and God lives in us. We know this because he gave us his spirit. We have seen that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And this is what we tell people now. Anyone who says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, is a person who lives in God, and God lives in that person. So we know the love that God has for us, and we trust that love. God is love. Everyone who lives in love lives in God, and God lives in them. If God's love is made perfect in us, we can be without fear on the day when God judges the world. We will be without fear because in this world, we are like Jesus. Where God's love is, there is no fear because God's perfect love takes away fear. It is his punishment that makes a person fear. So his love is not made perfect in the one who has fear. We love because God first loved us. If we say we love God, but hate any of our brothers or sisters in his family, we are liars. If we don't love someone we have seen, how can we love God? We have never even seen him. God gave us this command. If we love God, we must also love each other as brothers and sisters. Wow. Two verses here really jumped out at me. The first one was number 10. True love is God's love for us, not our love for God. One thing that was eating at me on wondering if I would go to heaven is because I know I don't love God like I should. I get distracted with so many other things and I don't spend the time studying his word like I should, praising him more like I should thanking him more like I should, and mostly not spending quiet time with him that is so desperately needed to listen so that I can give him time to speak to my spirit. And I know I fall severely short in these things, and it causes me to fear whether I'll go to heaven or not when I die. And I'm not saying I shouldn't do these things. I most certainly should. But I can have an assurance that when I fall short in doing them, that it's not about my love for God, but rather God's love for me. It seems that my focus has been on how much I'm capable of, when I should be focusing on what God is capable of. When I allow him to work through me as I ask forgiveness along the way, when I fall short. Now that is a powerful statement and one that I will be meditating on more. I assure you that. The other one that really jumped out at me was verses 17 through 19, which read, If God's love is made perfect in us, we can be without fear on the day when God judges the world. We will be without fear because in this world we're like Jesus. And where God's love is, there is no fear because God's perfect love takes away fear. It is his punishment that makes a person fear. So his love is not made perfect in the one who has fear. We love because God first loved us. So to me, that's saying, if I am walking in fear, then God's love is not made perfect. Sounds to me like I cause a break in the chain, if you will, when I fear. That I am like Jesus in this world. That where God's love is, there is no fear because God's perfect love takes that away, and that it is punishment that makes a person fear. And this is so true for myself. I want to live eternally. I fear standing before God and answering for anything that didn't get erased through me asking forgiveness with a remorseful heart. But these verses are telling me that His love is not made perfect in the one who has fear. So, in a sense, I am sinning if I am living in fear. I should be assured if I believe in him, am seeking him with my heart, 
and living my life with love for others that I should be able to live without fear and dread of where I'll go when I die. I should have complete assurance that I will be in heaven with my God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Also, we love God because God first loved us. From reading this, I see where I've gotten off track, so to speak, and have begun fretting about where I'll go when I die. The problem is, I'm putting my focus on me, on what I'm doing, and if I'm doing enough, about my shortcomings and my sins and my lack of loving. I should have my focus on God, what He has and is currently doing, that I am only capable of love because He loved me first. I don't have to strive to earn His love. I already have it and should be able to walk in great peace, knowing how much He loves me. Amen. Now, if that don't make you shout, nothing does. Let's go on to finish up. In 1 John 5, we read, The people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah are God's children. Anyone who loves the Father also loves the Father's children. How do we know that we love God's children? We know because we love God and we obey His commands. Loving God means obeying His commands, and God's commands are not too hard for us. Because everyone who is a child of God has the power to win against the world. It is our faith that has won the victory against the world. So who wins against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the one who came. He came with water and with blood. He did not come by water only. No. Jesus came by both water and blood, and the Spirit tells us that this is true. The Spirit is the truth. So there are three witnesses that tell us about Jesus, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three witnesses agree. We believe people when they say something is true, but what God says is more important. And this is what God told us. He told us the truth about his own son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the truth that God told us. But people who do not believe God makes God a liar because they do not believe what God told us about his son. This is what God told us. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. But whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I write this letter to you who believe in the Son of God. I write so that you will know that you have eternal life now. We can come to God with no doubts. This means that when we ask God for things, and those things agree with what God wants for us, God cares about what we say. He listens to us every time we ask him, so we know that he gives us whatever we ask from him. Suppose you see your fellow believer sinning, sin that does not lead to eternal death. You should pray for them. Then God will give them life. I am talking about people whose sin does not lead to eternal death. There is a sin that leads to eternal death. I don't mean that you should pray about that kind of sin. Doing wrong is always sin, but there is sin that does not lead to eternal death. We know that those who have been made God's children do not continue to sin. The Son of God keeps them safe. The evil one cannot hurt them. We know that we belong to God, but the evil one controls the whole world. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. So now we can know the one who is true, and we live in that true God. We are in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God, and he is eternal life. So, dear children, keep yourselves away from false gods. Amen. You know, 
God works in many different ways, and I had gone to my husband in tears one evening this week about the doubts and the fears I was having about how to know if I was going to heaven. I have a Bible app on my phone, and each night around 10, it sends me the verse of the day. And I always try to read the whole chapter that contains that verse just to get a broader understanding of what that verse means. That very night that I had gone to my husband, a verse in 1 John was the verse of the day. And suddenly, I had before me the scriptures that I needed to find my reassurance. These scriptures gave me the answers I needed to know whether or not I am living as God has instructed so that I can find the assurance that I'm looking for to know if I will go to heaven when I die. And I wanted to share them with you in case you were struggling with the same question. The verses I read that night are the very ones that I'm sharing with you today. Here is an overview of what I learned from them. First and foremost, I have to believe that God, Jehovah, exists and that he created the world, you, me, and everything in it. I have to recognize that I am a sinner and had God not sent his son Jesus, Yeshua, to die for my sins, there would be no way I could possibly live a sin-free life worthy of eternity on my own. But because of his great love, his faithfulness, his mercy, and his grace, I have the option, the free will to choose whether or not I desire to live eternally. And I do this by choosing to follow or ignore the teachings, the instructions, and the commands given to me in Jehovah's inspired word, the Holy Bible. This is a choice I personally believe that I make each day, hour, even minute of my life as I make my own free will choices between right or wrong. I learned that Christ gave me a special gift, the Holy Spirit, so I don't need anyone to teach me. The gift he gave me teaches me about everything. It is a true gift, not a false one. So I need to live in Christ, as his gift the Holy Spirit teaches me, and the word assured when I do this, I can be without fear on the day when Christ comes again. I will not need to hide or be ashamed when he comes. Hallelujah. I learned in these verses how to spot those who may be wolves in sheep's clothing because it said that those who do what is right are God's children. I guess you could say actions speak louder than words. If I see they are not doing right, then they aren't a child of God because when you're a child of God, you are diligently trying to live right and do the next right thing. I learned I need to be focusing and meditating more on the fact that true love is God's love for us, not our love for God. I learned that God's love is made perfect in me, in us, so I, we, can be without fear on the day when God judges the world. We will be without fear because in this world, we are like Jesus. Where God's love is, there is no fear because God's perfect love takes away that fear. It is his punishment that makes me fear. So his love is not made perfect in me when I have fear. I can only love because God first loved me, us. I learned that loving God means showing him through my actions, by obeying his command to love others, by caring for them and obeying his word and following his instructions as given in the whole Bible, not only the Ten Commandments, but also by participating in his festivals and feasts and to heed his warnings to not participate in pagan traditions. This is what God told us. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, but whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This letter was written to all who believe in the Son of God so that we will know we have eternal life now 
we can come to God with no doubts. This means that when we ask God for things and those things agree with what God wants for us, God cares about what we say. He listens to us every time we ask him. So we know that he gives us whatever we ask from him. I found this to be wonderful news. God, Jehovah loves me. And by believing in him and his son, Jesus, Yeshua, I have the Holy Spirit in me to help me as I navigate life, doing my best to live as instructed in God's entire holy word, the Bible. And asking forgiveness when I mess up allows me to be free from sin and to be able to live without the fear of death and God's judgment as I walk in love. Praise Jehovah. That is some good news. My conclusion, love Jehovah, love others, study his word so I can obey all his commands and teachings. Do not participate in man-made pagan traditions. Confess my sins to him, asking forgiveness with a truly repentant heart. And then I walk in freedom from sin and fear of judgment. I am a child of the king. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Yehovah. Praise him. As I wrap up today, I encourage you to go to our website at msgofhope.com. And on the podcast tab, you will find episode 43, where you can re-listen to this podcast and find the references for the scriptures that we read together today, so that you can study them for yourself and make any adjustments according to what God alone lays on your specific heart. And as always, thank you for listening to our podcast and for helping us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ by liking and sharing it with your friends. And if our podcast has helped you in any way, or you need prayer, we would love to hear about that. You can contact us at msgofhope1 at gmail.com or on our website through messaging. If you're interested in helping this ministry to be able to remain online, we have a donate button at the bottom of our website pages. Any donations will be used to pay for equipment or services needed in order to continue with this ministry. Now, as I log off, I want to bless you with a prayer given to the sons of Aaron. Ready? Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Until next time, Shalom.